chat with internal users and external users. And so I think it only makes sense that that business, business critical data gets enabled on the platform, right? So what does that mean? It means threat actors are targeting Teams users because they know it's such a large platform. Um, traditional threats such as malware, data theft, identity theft, and others are now being exploited via Teams. And you know, I, I created this session, and I, I say that sentence, uh, that last sentence, not to scare anybody, not to say like Teams has this big security vulnerability or anything like that. Um, I'm, I say that just because Teams is such a powerful platform. It's gained so much momentum and will only grow in the future um, on things like collaboration, chat, meetings, phone systems, conference rooms, all of the above. There's just more eyes on the platform. And unfortunately what that means, some of those eyes that are on the platform don't always have the best intent, right? They're in it for their own gain. They don't care about what you're doing in the Teams platform. They want to get something out of it for themselves. And the fact that there's such a large user base in the platform makes them concerned. These are just a few headlines that I've pulled recently as I was preparing for this session that discuss Microsoft Teams users being the target of some of these threats. While I'll say Teams threats not as high in, in volume as you see in email today, but um, you know, collaboration tools such as Microsoft Teams and other, other platforms, I'm not gonna name them at, at this conference, um, but they're becoming bigger targets by the day. As the younger workforce embraces these tools and conducts business using these tools, um, really just the bigger the surface area becomes. So now that we understand what's really at stake from a security standpoint and what we need to protect, I wanna walk through some of these threats um, that uh, are posed to your organization and specifically the users or your users in, in the Teams environment. Now I'm gonna cover these threats mainly from an external threat perspective, meaning people that are outside of your organization that are trying to get into your organization, trying to steal your data, trying to deploy ransomware, trying to hold your data ransom for hostage type of thing. Now, that's not to say there aren't internal threats from internal users that pose a threat uh, in your environment, such as oversharing of data, um, you know, internal users stealing data and then leaving the organization. But for now, um, I really wanna focus uh, the, the main uh, point of this uh, session on external parties. So let's get into it. Threat number one, phishing. Um, phishing threats in email and exchange have been around for years and continue to increase. There, uh, we know there's a huge market for security tools with, related to, uh, with regards to email. There's email filtering tools, uh, there's, there's tools that have anti-phishing capabilities, they have capabilities um, for, to protect you against hyperlinks, there's uh, tools to protect against attachments in the email, uh, making sure that those attachments don't get into the end user's mailbox. And now, all those same threats now come to Teams. And so whether that's via fraudulent chat messages, fraudulent channel messages, a lot of those same, uh, same concepts that we see in email, we now need to protect those same things within the Microsoft Teams platform. And, and uh, my next point is how do external users do that, right? Like email is SMTP protocol, pretty straightforward. If I have an email server that supports SMTP, I can send emails back and forth and they communicate via that protocol. But how can I do that within the Teams platform? So um, I'm gonna talk about a lot about default today. Um, so by default, if let's say I've got a brand new Teams tenant, right? I signed up for Microsoft 365 today, I got a new B5 license and I have Teams. Um, users, in your uh, users that are not part of the organization by default can send Teams messages into your organization. They can do that one of two ways. They can do that via Skype consumer, 
Um, they can find your users via Skype, Skype consumer by searching for email addresses in your organization, and they can send your users messages. Um, and also, I'll call it, I don't know what they're calling it anymore, Teams for Personal Life, Teams for Consumer, Teams for Life, I don't know what the name of it is anymore, um, but Teams users that are not managed by an organization, let's call it that. Um, and it could also be Teams users that are managed by organizations, so another company. They could, if they have teams and they are uh, have these settings as well, they can send external chat messages into your organization. They can see your users' presence. They can call your users on Teams as well. Skype consumer, yes, not Skype for business. Skype consumer. Yep. Skype for business. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, so I want to show you some of these examples of what these messages look like when these messages show up in your organization and what your end users might see. Um, so let's start with external messages that are sent from Skype consumer users. You can see here that uh, up at the top of the screen it does have the, the classic Skype consumer logo. Um, and so what we're seeing here is what the team, your, your Teams user will see. They'll see the Skype icon, they'll see this message stating that the message originated from the outside and asking your Teams user, do they want to block or accept the message? You can also see there's, al there's a link here that they can preview the message. Um, this is kind of what the preview message looks like. Um, and so again, it, it, it shows an accept or block, but you'll also see it does actually give you a, a warning about phishing messages can possibly, this might be phishing. Um, and the interesting part about this message is as I was creating this demo, um, I, I have my Skype consumer account, and my display name in my con Skype consumer account is Sean Flake. My display name in my Teams account, Sean Flake. Nowhere when I sent that message did it indicate something was wrong with that message, right? Um, and so when we talk about phishing in email, the main threat is, hey, someone spoofed your CEO, someone spoofed your HR manager and sent you an email and said, hey, transfer money or something like that. That same threat also exists in email. The issue is, though, in email, we've got tools to combat spoofing like that. We've got SPF, Qpin, Qmark, and I know I'm getting technical details of Exchange here, um, but tools like that, protocols like that, don't really exist in Teams at the moment. Um, so we've got to think about spoofing in a different way uh, when these messages show up in our organization. Um, so this is, a, this is an obviously an example of an external Skype consumer message sending into your Teams user. And really, as you can see here, all it takes for this message to arrive in your end user's chat list is clicking the send button. And how easy it is when a user's multitasking and they see a message from Sean, oh yeah, I like that message, accept, right? And now, that message is now living in their chat list, just like a, 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 a phishing email would land in your in inbox, right? We wanna prevent that from happening um, if we can. Um, so this here is an example of an external user who is using Teams, either Teams for personal use, or teams as part of a company, and what that looks like to your end user. You can see it looks similar to the last screen. Um, obviously no Skype logo, no Teams logo. It just says, hey, this person wants to chat with you and they bounced you outside of your organization. Um, so these external users, they could use this avenue as a way to send impersonated messages, malicious links, links to malicious files, et cetera. So, what allows these users to do this? Um, how can these use external users to just lob these messages into my organization? Again, I, I mentioned the default settings. If I create a brand new tenant today, what am I gonna see? I'm gonna see this screen. Teams Admin Center, Users, External Access. There's three main settings I wanna cover here. Um, um, this one here. This top one is external Teams users. 
uh, specifically that arrow is change for personal use can send messages into your internal users if they know your email address. Um, they can see your presence. They can make Teams calls. Um, the bottom arrow here, uh, I mentioned we were talking about Skype consumer. These users can send messages into your Teams users again if they know your email address. They can they can look you up in the directory search and, and see that. The other setting, this setting specifically determines if Teams users in other organizations um, can talk to your users. Um, so this would be users at other companies, right? Um, the default setting is allow all domains. And so really, um, when I think about it here, what is to stop a threat actor from creating a malicious tenant and then, again, firing off messages into the world, right? That's what I think about. That's the threat that I think about. Um, um, anybody can go, you know, office365.com, put in your credit card. I've got a new Black Lives Matter, right? I've got a Teams link, right? So you can think about that. So we've walked through what some of these external messages could look like from an external, you know, and how they're allowed in. I want to walk through some ways to protect against these these external messages and these messages. You know, not all of them are malicious, right? Um, there's a there's a lot of good intent out there and a lot of good reasons to use external access in Teams, um, but uh, you know, it's an opportunity for malicious messages to show up in your organization as well. Um, so recommendation number one, turn it off. Um, easier said than done sometimes, right? Um, but if we don't let external users send unsolicited messages into our organization, that essentially closes that door. Um, to take this a step further for other organizations, we can only allow chat presence and calling from external users with organizations that we trust. So you can see the setting up there was changed to, it was changed from allow all domains to allow only specific domains that I trust. I get the question a lot, because I make this recommendation a lot to customers when I'm talking to them about the security in their Teams call, you know, security presence. Well, you know, I can't just turn this setting off, right? What's gonna happen? I'm gonna break a bunch of stuff for these Teams users. And for the, the bottom two settings right there, um, yeah, uh, I don't really have a way, and we don't really have a way in Teams to, to audit, like, what external Skype consumer users are we talking to? We don't. Um, but if you go to the top one, and this is recent, this is as of like three or four months ago, I get the questions like, what about other organizations that we're talking to? Like, what if it's a customer? What if it's a partner? I don't want to stop my users from chatting with them. Maybe they do real business with me across that model. And so in the Teams Admin Center under reports, there's a new report available. Again, fairly new. Um, so if you haven't looked at reports in a while, check it out. It's called External Domain Activity. This can show you the last 30 to 60 days of external domains that your Teams users have had a chat with, either whether it was started by them or started by you or your internal users. Um, so um, really shortening this down. So this setting, you know, I know a lot of you have come from the Wink and the OCS and the Skype for Business days, right? This is just federation. That's what people call it. And I know there's always been an argument, especially back in the Skype Wink days, of like, I want to increase adoption of this, this, this feature. Turn, you know, open federation. Open my organization up to teams so we can chat. Make it better. I think, and I, what I recommend is that argument has kind of tipped the scales a little bit. Because Teams is such a huge platform, it's almost too much of a risk to just say, I'm open federation, right? As, as great as that feature is, and as awesome as it is to collaborate with external parter, partners and customers, it's just too much of a risk. I can't, I can't allow that door to be opened to allow malicious users to get in. Are you talking about guest user access? Um, this is, oh, I forgot. 
Um, so recommendation number two has to deal with um, a, a license and a product called Defender for Office 365 Plan 1. Um, you can buy this standalone. It's part of Microsoft 365 version of Cranium. It's part of E5. Yes, there's licensing nuance here. I'm happy to chat about licensing after that because um, I know this is everyone's favorite topic. But specifically, there's two products within Defender for Office 365 Plan 1 um, that I want to talk about. Safe attachments and safe links. The top uh, screenshot there are safe attachments uh, for Teams, SharePoint, and OneDrive. It's simply a tick box, right? If you have this product, make sure that tick box is ticked. But safe attachments, traditionally, if you're not aware, um, it's used for email, and it's used to detonate attachments before they ever get to your user. And when I say detonate, uh, as the mail goes through the filtering process before it gets to your inbox, that attachment is stripped out and actually opened up in a virtual machine, a virtual environment in Microsoft's data center. Um, and so if something happens when that uh, attachment is opened up, it says, okay, something bad happened. Okay, I opened up an Excel file and a bunch of scripts showed up. Okay, that's probably malware. We're gonna block that attachment. We're not gonna allow that email to arrive in your end user's inbox. Similar concept here, except we're not blowing through mail filters here anymore. Uh, when Teams, when this is used specifically in Teams, so if I upload a file to Teams, it's essentially uploading to SharePoint, right? It's built into the back end of Teams. Um, and files in SharePoint and Teams get asynchronous, asynchronously scanned for viruses. Now, by having safe attachments and having that box ticked, along with being scanned for viruses, it's also detonating those files in a virtual environment and you get your email address back, right? And that's, that's bad. Safe links. Uh, this is any URL that is in a Teams chat message, channel message, are checked against a list of known malicious URLs at the time of click. So if, you, if the user clicks on the URL and um, it's known to be a malicious domain name or malicious website, the user's gonna get a big red screen in the web browser saying uh, this was blocked, this was not blocked, this was allowed to occur. Uh, next is Defender for Office 365 Plan 2. Um, so more licensing, right? Um, but there are a few features in Defender for Office 365 Plan 2 um, that are designed to help better respond to malicious messages and to help make sure users don't click on them um, if they don't have to. Um, so this specific feature, when you have this license in your environment, it will automatically show up for all your Teams users. It's called Report Suspicious Messages. Um, and so what that looks like is um, on the chat message <laughs> where um, you know user, user clicks the ellipse, they're going to see the Report This Message button, and this is the screen that they're going to see. They can report this message as spam, phishing, or malicious content. Um, when they do that, unfortunately, the message doesn't go away. Um, I hope that is changed in the future, and I've provided that feedback that the message isn't pulled out um, of, of their environment. Um, but admins can choose what to do when what the admins can choose what to do with these messages when they get reported by end users. Uh, they can choose to send these messages to Microsoft as a reporting mechanism, and they can also choose to report these messages to your security operations mailbox so that your SOC can review the spam that goes in. Um, a, lot, a, a lot of organizations have similar processes for email, like the, the malicious the phishing email comes in. Hopefully your users are trained to report it as phishing and so your, your SOC or whoever manages your, your security can review it. Downfall of this feature right now is it only works with internal messages and not messages from external users. So I, you know, I had to make that as a caveat because I've been talking about external messages, right? But uh, hopefully that's changed. Um, the next feature here of Defender for Office 365 Plan 2 is called Zero Hour Auto Purge or ZAP for Teams. Um, this is post delivery message removal from for attacks that are identified as malware or high confidence phishing. Uh, and this is, uh, this is uh, you know, Zero Hour Auto Purge or ZAP again. 
came from the email world. So uh, messages that passed all the filtering checks, landed in the user's inbox, and then 10 minutes later it was reported that that, uh, that message was phishing or contained malicious uh, content in it. Um, Microsoft or this specific tool would pull that message back out automatically. They wouldn't wait for the user to delete it. They wouldn't wait for them to report it. They would just programmatically go grab that message out of every mailbox and pull it back out. Same concept here with phishing emails. So if that happens in your environment, that's what it's going to look like. The message is blocked to phishing filters and other things that are going to happen if it does happen. Um, again, as, the, as, the, as, the, as I mentioned in the last lecture, not available yet for next level traffic. Only available for next level traffic. That's the next level that they're trying to get to. Um, these would be uh, federated sites, external access sites, not necessarily web pages. Um, and then recommendation number three, again, with Defender for Office 365 plan two. Um, before I kind of reveal the feature, right? I'm not saying there's only gonna be a feature here, but you know, I couldn't talk about phishing and recommendations for phishing prevention without talking about user journeys, right? Uh, yes, we have all these cool features, but if uh, if the user's not trained to constantly handle it, then it's not gonna work. obviously want to make sure we're training our users on phishing messages and malicious content. And to do that, Microsoft specifically offers a tool called Attack Simulation. Is anyone here using Attack Simulation training in your own environment? Awesome. Great. Um, and more specifically, um, over the la I feel like this tool has gained so much maturity over the last five or six years. You know, when this tool first came out, it was very immature, and there were other vendors on the market uh, that had really great training platforms and they had really great simulation tools to send uh, email phishing simulations to your users. Um, you know, attack simulation wasn't really there yet. I, I honestly feel, and I have a lot of customers that have moved away from all their third party platforms and moved to attack simulation training um, to do these types of things. Yes, it's probably because they pay for M365 and they're trying to cut out other vendors, right? But um, nevertheless, I think it's a, a decent tool, a good tool to use. Uh, and specifically now, if you go into attack simulation training, there is training content in there to, to assign to your users to teach them about team phishing specifically. There's tons of content in here just about phishing in general, what, what phishing is, how to look for it in email, you know, how to look for um, bogus email addresses and bogus systems and, and things like that in your email, right? Um, but now, um, and it, to be honest, uh, once I assign these to users, they come back, I get feedback saying like, I didn't know Teams is a phishing platform. And so uh, I really, really heard a lot of feedback around uh, this specific training module when I assigned it to users. Uh, and this next one, um, I'm pretty excited about this. This is still in a private preview if you look at the document on Microsoft Learn. But uh, the same way you can launch phishing simulations hate to say against your users, um, but phishing simulations to your users uh, with fake uh, phishing emails, you can now do that with Teams chat. Um, so you can send bogus fake Teams chats with links and attachments and things like that in Teams. And again, measuring and testing your users to see what they're gonna click on, what, what type of thing they're gonna see when you simulate that. Um, so um, again, that's a feature I'm pretty excited about. Um, as I'm talking about this, this is becoming such a, a bigger target that um, you know, being able to test it and make sure it's not phishing is gonna be a big deal. Threat number two. Um, threat number two is related to external participants in, users, in team simulations. And remember, we're talking about default settings here. And before I get into some of the threats, um, I wanna talk about the three ways that an external can join your team. Um, and this is something that I, I forget about a lot, but I think it's a good, uh, it's just a good thing to know. When you have external participants in your Teams meetings, like what access do they have, right? Teams meetings now have jam, they have chat, they have apps, they have collaborative notes, they have loops. Um, you can do 
different rooms with them. You can do all kinds of things between the two rooms. So there's a lot, obviously a lot of data and everything like that. But number one, anonymous access. Anyone with a meeting link um, can join the Teams meeting. Um, these anonymous users don't have access to the Teams chat before and after the meeting. Uh, they don't have access to Luke, uh, the collaborative meeting notes. But the interesting thing is um, there are like bots and um, clients that have been created using Azure Communication Services or ACS. Those are sometimes considered to be anonymous access to the chat. So that could be, could be a potential as well. As well. Uh, the next one, external access. These are authenticated external users in the organization. Um, so remember this screen uh, that we talked about in chat? Same thing applies to meetings. Um, this, I mean, I find this to be super interesting um, because all of that chat access and things like that that I have with, with that now applies to meetings as well. So these external access users, uh, if they're in your approved domain list, uh, they have access to the chat before and after the meeting. They have access to the link, et cetera. Uh, last one being a guest access. Uh, this would be guest accounts that are created in your Entra ID for external users. Um, these are three ways that external users can join the Teams meeting. Um, so now that we understand how they can get in or how they can participate in your meetings, what's the risk or the threat um, there are things that external users can do in your Teams meetings that could be inappropriate. There could be things that they do that you want to prevent. Uh, it's also possible that anonymous users could start Teams meetings that you scheduled with them to do things like look at the meeting content, uh, create the RSVP to attendees so you have their email address and things like that. Take meeting lobby, for example. There are settings in Teams meeting policies um, that allow external users to bypass the lobby and start meetings without an even an in internal user of, of letting them in. You can have external users hanging out in your Teams meeting, right? Um, they could, uh, you know, it could be a, a, a meeting coming up. It could be a meeting link uh, that was in the past. They could just join it and start the meeting getting to the content. Um, you may want to prevent that. Uh, another one I would talk about a lot is meeting roles. By default, everyone's a presenter when they get into your meeting, even external users. Um, presenters can do things like take over meeting sharing, um, take over screens, present inappropriate content. Um, this is something we might want to control. Um, so what are the recommendations here? My primary recommendation uh, for threats with Teams meetings is to configure your Teams meeting policies according to whatever external participant requires requirements that you have. Uh, now there's a lot of settings here that I'm going to list. I'm not going to say like turn this one on, turn this one off, right? You have to, you have to understand uh, what's right for your organization. But for the top level, at the global level, yes, we're going to allow anonymous meeting access at the global level, but if we do need to block anonymous users from accessing our meetings, we can do that at a um, user policy level. Um, do you want to choose if you want to allow external users to give or grant control in meetings? Uh, choose whether you or not you want to allow anonymous or dial-in users to start your meetings without being a, a, you know, let in from the lobby. Again, who can bypass the lobby? Same thing. Um, who can record your meetings? Uh, who can start the recording? Uh, the designated presenter role mode. Uh, this is an interesting one where you can change the settings in your meeting policy to say when, when this user creates a Teams meeting and external participants show up, what do they show up as? Do they show up as a presenter or do they, do they show up as an attendee? So that is one I, I see a lot is I don't want all my users showing up as presenters. Uh, and then the last one is anonymous user client types. Uh, I mentioned earlier that custom apps that are built on Azure Communication Services they can show up as uh, anonymous users. Do you want to allow that? Do you want to allow uh, anonymous users to use ACS to join your meeting? Um, and so again, uh, to summarize that, that's just a quick one. Uh, check out your meeting policies in, in Teams Admin Center. Uh, a lot of good things in there as well. Uh, threat number three, apps in Teams. 
So really, uh, everyone's aware of Teams has a big app platform. Uh, when you click on the app um, on the left-hand side of your Teams client, there's thousands of applications in there that you can, you can edit and use. Um, and again, um, the question is, what apps do we want to introduce in our, into our environment? Um, by default, end users can install third-party apps, and they can upload their own custom apps into the Teams event. Um, that's just a quick screenshot. Uh, if they go into apps, click Manage Apps, and they can click that button, and they can upload something that they wrote or somebody else wrote, uh, right? But both of these settings, third-party and custom apps, they have the capability of introducing vulnerabilities into your environment. You know, if you didn't write the code for these and you don't know, um, you know, what vulnerabilities might be written into the code for these apps, well, it could be a potential one. Um, so what's the recommendation here uh, to prevent these vulnerabilities? Again, block them. Um, at least at the global level, right? Uh, I want to block these settings at the global level but it gives admins the ability to control which apps get, to get deployed to the user. I think about it like this. Uh, a common security practice for end user PCs, whether it's Mac or Windows, is I'm not gonna grant my end users admin access to their own devices, right? Um, they do not have the ability to install apps a lot of times on their, on their computer. They can't install Chrome, they can't install Adobe Reader, things like that, and also, Hopefully, they can't install malware um, as, a, as another benefit of that, right? Um, kind of the same concept here with Teams, um, only involves installing apps in Teams and not apps on your desktop or your, or your PC. But kind of the same, uh, same, uh, same concept there. So disable third-party apps and custom apps for your vulnerabilities. And then the last threat um, is around identity and devices. So as we're all aware, Teams authentication is built on Entra ID. Uh, it's also the basis for all other M365 services, so I understand this could quickly turn into a conversation around Entra ID security. Um, but I do want to offer just a couple scenarios of things I see within customers um, and, and you know how to protect those. So at, at the most basic level, when you go to log into Teams, let's walk through the quick authentication flow. User, user gets a login screen, they type in their user ID, they type in their password, uh, that gets checked against Entra ID. Entra ID is using the OAuth protocol, they send the user back a token, uh, and they get access. Take that a step further, they type in their username and password, and hopefully they have MFA enabled, they get an SMS uh, uh, text message or authenticator notification, um, any MFA uh, option there, and again, they get a token. Um, now let's say they're logging in from to Teams from a public computer, a home computer that is potentially compromised. Um, it's, it's almost impossible to know what state these devices are in as administrators. And then, so that's one scenario. Let's take another scenario. Let's say this user gets fixed, right? Uh, we talked about fixing earlier, but let's say it's let's say it happened. They click on the link, they type in their credentials, um, and their token can potentially be stolen. Um, and what that means is if their Azure AD or Entra ID token gets stolen, they can take that token and they can replay that token to log into Teams and other M365 services from any device in the world. Um, and the, the tough part about that is, is that token already passed MFA, right? And so that's kind of scary in the fact that Someone has my credentials out there, they're logging in as me, and even though I have MFA enabled from my account, they don't need it. They don't care because the token that they have already passed MFA. Um, so I understand these are scenarios that are more or less enter ID threat, but again with um, you know, teams being such a primary target for phishing, I would qualify that as a potential threat, right? Um, so that's why I, where I'm going with this. Um, so a couple recommendations. Um, first recommendation would be to not allow Teams access from unmanaged devices. So we can ensure that Teams is being accessed from company-owned devices. We know the health of those company-owned devices, whether they're uh, Windows PCs, Macs, iOS, Android devices. 
we know if they have the latest firmware, we know if they have the latest software, the latest updates, we know if they have endpoint protection or antivirus tools. Um, so we can ensure that, um, and so, so that bullet point, um, hybrid enter IED join is the name there, and, and the compliant ID that's in there for various different clients, right? And the second recommendation would be to use fish resistant authentication. So let's go back to that scenario where the token got stolen. Um, these are fish resistant authentication methods. Um, and if I'm using one of these authentication methods, even if that threat actor uses that stolen token to try to log into Zoom from another country, they don't have my FIDO2 security key. They don't have my certificate. They don't have my email. And so that basically thwarts that entire attack for me. They can't get into my account. Or we're using it to steal the token. And soon, um, you're going to be able to use pass keys in the Microsoft Authenticator app. If you're not familiar with pass keys, this is one of the things I'm most excited about. Uh, it's basically FIDO2, but I don't have to carry around and purchase a USB key for all my users. Every user already has a phone. They already have the Authenticator app. They can use a pass key inside of that Authenticator app as uh, fish resistant authentication. It's still very new. Uh, just came out in public preview last week. Um, yep, uh, it is um, now available, but um, that would be a way uh, to ensure that tokens were stolen, external users could not log in to your computer account, to track their team, track their email, other things of that nature. And granted, all of these methods do require conditional access policies and enter ID for enforcement. Um, so I can't for that forget that as part of these recommendations, right? And as I mentioned, we could go way deeper into enter ID security, um, but I, I felt I wanted to just walk through a quick couple quick scenarios that I'm seeing out there with my customers and a way to combat those and ensure um, that those things are, are secure. Um, so we've gone through um, some recommendations on some specific threats, right? Um, but that being said, there's always a need for a comprehensive set, kind of set of standards uh, for these settings. Like how do we configure, uh, I get the question a lot, how do I just make sure my team's tenant is secure uh, and all my settings are right? So there's always the default settings, and then there's the recommended configuration, right? Um, so I want to walk through one tool that I found that kind of does a great job of talking to you about uh, recommended configurations, and also does a great job of explaining why. Like, why are you recommending certain settings are the way they are? What am I protecting against? And things like that. That tool is called the Microsoft 365 Secure Configuration Base Set. This is a project that was created by uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, better known as CISA. Uh, CISA is a United States federal agency. And this tool was created as a, to, to give baseline settings to other US government agencies and other organizations. But, and, and the quote right there uh, says that. However, they've published this to the public it is usable by anyone. So not only do they have secure configuration baselines for Microsoft Teams, they also have them for uh, Enter ID, um, uh, Exchange Online, Power BI, things like that. So if you need to manage more things than just Teams, I recommend checking these out. Um, this is just a quick screenshot um, of, of what you'll see. And so you'll see this secure configuration baseline is in GitHub, and specifically they've created a project called uh, SCUBA, uh, Secure Cloud Business Applications is what it stands for. Um, so that one was for specifically for Teams, but this is an example of a few baseline settings that CISA has recommended. And yes, they're gonna closely match to what we talked about earlier. Um, the first one there, external access for users shall only be enabled on a per domain basis, right? We're changing the default taking our, our settings back to the back a little bit. And then the bottom one there also, unmanaged users shall not be enabled to initiate contact with unmanaged users. Again, kind of controlling that off and saying who gets to see our settings. Um, so as part of this secure baseline uh, uh, and the, the SCUBA project that I mentioned, um, they released a PowerShell tool that you can run in your own environment. Uh, you can 
and go to this website, grab the PowerShell tool, and um, it will spit out an HTML report that looks like this. You can click into any of these links and see how your environment is configured, and you can also see how your environment doesn't match up to what they recommend, right? And so this tool, uh, obviously a benchmarking tool against a list of recommended settings. There's a similar tool that Microsoft already has called Secure Score. I'm sure many of you are using it. Um, don't get me wrong, I love Secure Score. I use it, I highly recommend it. I feel that this tool is more comprehensive when it comes to security settings than Secure Score, at least from the Teams perspective. If I look at the recommended settings in Secure Score for Teams versus the recommended settings in here for Teams, this is a little bit, this has more options. So um, I recommend checking this out. Um, so in summary, right, we know Teams is an immensely popular platform, but the unfortunate side effect is that threat actors are looking to deceive our users um, via phishing and other tactics. Um, you know, we as Teams administrators, we need to make sure we're staying apprised of these threats, staying apprised of new settings that are getting released in the platform, and you know, we can ensure we know how to protect against them. Um, and so with that summary, you know, I hope that my goal out of this session was I hope you got a few actionable items you can take back into your set, into your own tenant. We're all on a security journey, right? The journey never ends. So um, anything we can do to share knowledge to with regards to recommendation and settings, that was my starting goal with this session. So um, with that, you know, thanks everyone. Appreciate you coming out and taking some questions. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Yes. Um, yeah, so the, uh, for the recording, the question was, a lot of AI bots that are being released now that uh, will join the Teams meeting, uh, and if I had a con any concerns about that. Um, really, the, the main thing I can say about that is um, what are they built on, right? Uh, I gotta understand what are they built on. Are they built on Azure Communication Services? Because I can really, I can kind of answer that question with the anonymous users and what kind of clients am I um, allowing in my organization? I can set that via policy, but if they're doing something else that's not built on that, um, I really have to understand what protocol are they using? What mechanism are like? Are they impersonating a real user, or are they doing something else programmatically? Uh, I really have to understand what they're doing. Stop the bidding, invite them in, get them in. Okay, so that's another option that I haven't thought of, but okay. Um, so in that scenario, what I've heard, and I've seen a lot of government organizations do this too, that um, they block anonymous users. And sometimes they even block external users too. So the only way that you can access a meeting is if, is if you're coming in as a guest user account. I think you mentioned that earlier, um, where you're, uh, you're physically authenticating with a username and password to your tenant, and that's the only way you can get into that meeting. Otherwise, anonymous access is blocked. So I've seen that a lot, but that's just my opinion.
then, yeah, so uh, the question was, when we disable external access and we queue up per domain basis, you get, you get questions two and a half hours later of users saying, I need my access back. Um, I've had the same thing happen, and kind of the best advice I can give is it has to be an organizational communication thing before making that decision, so you have to basically make it known to all your users that this is a security loophole that we're closing up, and if you need external access, here's the process, like submit this ticket, submit this request, get approval from your manager, and they have to go through this process, and at really that point, it becomes a change management issue versus a technical issue at that point. So that's just kind of what I would say. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.